Welcome to Diffused Congruence. This is episode three of the American Muslim Experience. My name is Zaki Hassan, and I'm joined once again by my partner, Pervez Ahmed. Welcome back, everybody. Good to be here. And our guest for this episode is Kamran Pasha, and uh, I'm very excited to have Kamran on for us because the, the focus of this episode is really about Muslims in the media. We want to talk about Muslim engagement and how we tell Muslim stories uh, and how Muslims tell other people's stories for that matter. And I feel like Kamran is somebody who brings a lot of experience to this. He is a producer of television. He's worked on The Bionic Woman on NBC. He worked on Kings. He also worked on Disney's Tron Uprising, a show that I enjoyed greatly, which uh, was too short-lived. Uh, and he's also a novelist. He wrote a novel about the, the rise of Islam through the eyes of uh, Hazrat Aisha, called uh, Mother of the Believers. Kamran, well, first of all, I want to welcome you to the show. Thanks for coming on. Yes, Assalamu alaikum. Thank you very much for inviting me tonight. Uh, Wa alaikum assalam. I guess, first up, I think your journey is a very interesting one. You did not start out planning to get into uh, the world of media production, and this is this is kind of a sideways journey you ended up on. So maybe you can walk us through uh, how you ended up to where you are now. Sure. I mean, I was born in Pakistan, and, and I moved with my family to uh, New York when I was a small boy, about three or four years old, and grew up in Brooklyn. And, you know, I think... Like many of our generation, I was obsessed with movies and, and cartoons and TV shows as a child, but the idea of ever being involved in this industry was not a real possibility in my mind. You know, it's just not something that people coming from our backgrounds saw as, as a path. And so, you know, I never really uh, thought about that as a realistic career option. What I did discover as a child growing up in New York was that I was very different from my fellow Pakistanis and fellow Muslims in that I had no interest in math or science at all. And thankfully, my parents figured out quickly that, you know, we can't actually force him to be interested in the subject. You know, I'd always been uh, a writer. I'd loved books since I was a, a, a small boy, right? And, you know, I was obsessed with I'm still a bibliophile. I took thousands of books. And so i have been fascinated with storytelling since I was a child. And I knew that my skills were in writing. And I thought, okay, I'm not sure... I'm going to make any money doing that because, again, from that generation that we were coming in, our parents and the kids they were raising were just obsessed with achieving security because they struggled so much just to come here. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that I ended up having the long term plan of I'm going to go to law school because after having watched TV shows like LA Law, I thought, okay, well, those guys are good writers and they're communicators. I can do that, right? And so that had been my plan. And, and I'm happy to go over in more detail any of those steps in the journey. But what had happened was, you know, I, I'd been a journalist for a few years out of college, I went to law school. And uh, while I was in law school, uh, you know, I ended up writing a screenplay just to pass the time. And it was just literally by the grace of Allah that I graduated. I was working in a law firm in New York. I had achieved the j objective that I had thought was my realistic plan uh, from childhood. And right. then I was bored. I just wasn't very happy with it. And even though it was a very nice law firm, very nice people, and I just wasn't fulfilled. And I took out the screenplay I wrote in, in, in school and just started sending it around to agents. Uh, and, you know, subhanAllah, one agent... They said, I emailed me, said, I really like this. Let me see if I can represent you. Represent me. Okay. You think I have a career? I mean, okay, wow. And he, subhanAllah, was able to get me in touch with some producers. I sold some things to Paramount, and I, was, I ended up joining the Writers Guild, and that was back in 2001. And I said, you know, I could suddenly see a path to becoming successful with the skill that Allah gave me writing. And so in 2001, I moved to Los Angeles, and alhamdulillah, I've been here now, I guess, 13 years. Hmm. Uh, so, yeah. Now, what, what was uh, the, the script that uh, got, got you noticed? Well, the script that I wrote has never been produced. And, you know, honestly, the draft, it's, you know, any writer will know this. You know, you go back to look at your first thing, like, oh, my God, I can't believe this is so bad. I can't believe this, guy, this launched my career, right? But, you know, you're, hopefully your craft improves over time. But it was a script, actually, uh, it was a horror movie. I'd written a teen horror movie like a slasher-type film, you know, and it, it, and it, because I'm fascinated by two things. I'm fascinated by grand historical epics and teen horror movies. So those are two things that interest me. And, <laughs> there you you go. Know, and so at the time, I thought, you know, if there's any way to... Because remember, it was just a one-in-a-billion shot that I thought that I, that I could... I was just writing the script out of boredom to be creative, mm -hmm. and some small part of me thought, you know, if there's any one-in-a-billion chance of sending it to anybody in Hollywood, do something that's really commercial, uh, you know, a nice horror movie. There's always good horror movies, and I like those. And so that's, that's what I wrote. And that never got made, but it ended up getting me uh, read uh, a little bit in Hollywood and ended up getting in front of a TV show uh, what was on the network that was then UPN, which mm -hmm. was absorbed into CW a few years ago. But UPN had a TV show called Seven Days, 
I remember that show. Yeah, yeah. I remember that show. Yeah, it was about a time traveler, right? Who would go back in time seven days and fix a major disaster that would With, happen. Uh, Jonathan LaPaglia, I believe, was on that. Yes, that's right. That's good memory. That's why, that's why you do your, your Zucky's Corner. You remember these things. That's uh, right. He's a walking <laughs> wiki. <laughs> that's great. But, uh, but, yeah, so he, I ended up getting on the phone with a producer from the show and pitched him some ideas. And he's like, oh, that's a pretty good idea. Um, I'd love to read a synopsis of it. Give me something in the next month or so. And I was so excited that I was on the phone with a real-life Hollywood producer. This was mm-hmm. the result of an agent having liked my horror script and who represented this gentleman and said, maybe I should be in touch with my client because he might be interested in directing your horror script. I said, wow, sure. And I, you know, I pitched him my idea. And he was so, and when he said, yeah, I'd love to read something about it, I got so excited that that weekend, I pitched him on a Friday afternoon uh, when I was finishing work at the law firm, and I got so excited that I spent the whole weekend, I wrote the entire script for the TV episode in the next two days. And on Monday, I emailed him the script. He's like, I thought I was expecting a synopsis, like a five-page synopsis two weeks from now. He's like, where did the script come from? So I just wrote it. He's like, nobody writes a script in two days. Only David E. Kelly is famous for writing scripts in two days. <laughs> I know turns him out. Practice or, uh, or, um, or the gentleman who created the West Wing. I mean, these people, the only these masters of Hollywood can do scripts in two or three days. But he read it, he's like, oh my God, the script's actually really good. You know, it's, it's good enough to be on our show. Mm-hmm. And they bought, they bought the script, they bought another one, and you know, subhanAllah, it sold two scripts to this TV show. One of them got produced, and away my career went. And I discovered I, I was really fast, and I discovered that that was unusual. Mm-hmm. Now, I was just going to ask, I mean, yep. as a horror movie buff myself, and now that I'm speaking with an artist, I mean, I, I'd love to hear what's what were some of the uh, horror movies that you grew up watching and that you enjoyed? Are they the more sort of supernatural kind, or is it more of the slasher films? What do you like, and what kind of maybe inspired you uh, into your script? Well, I'd say, you know, artistically... When it comes to horror, because I still I'm fascinated by horror because horror reflects the dark subconscious, right? It reflects our deepest fears and also yeah. our hopes, right? And so uh, I think the movies that have the most impact on me are, are still probably The Exorcist, right? Which is one yes. of the great movies because it'll still scare you today, right? I mean, yeah. it, 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 it hits you on a very deep level, on a spiritual level, you know. But I've never been a fan of the torture porn. Uh, mm-hmm. I thought the first Saw was very well written and very intelligent, and then I just I never got into the genre of people just being horrifically tortured for the, the sake of the amusement of the audience. But an intelligent slasher movie like Halloween, you know, produced by a Muslim, Mustafa Akkad, yeah. Halloween okay. uh, is to this day I think a stunningly horrifying movie because it, it understands less is more. You, the, you don't really see the killings and the stabbings; it's just suspense. And so I mean, those I think are the form uh, the movies that I think hold up and the ones that influence me. So. Uh, now, now you mentioned Mustafa Akkad, and I think that's that's a good uh, pivot point here because because something he did uh, quite quite successfully, I would argue, is that he was able to parlay his kind of mainstream success with Halloween and use that as as something to build on when he made the message when he made Line of the Desert, and I definitely see in your own work you have you've sort of you've worked in the in in more mainstream productions but you've also worked hard to affect and uh, in a in a positive direction the portrayal of muslims uh in in media and uh when when did that start happening for you when when did you become when did when did you realize that this was something that you were in a position to do well you know it's what i discovered in my journey is that the only things that I'm able to sell in this town are things that come from my heart. Whenever I try to write for a perceived market or maybe they will like this thing, if it's not coming from my heart, it comes across stilted and people can sense that it's just formulaic, even if it's allegedly well written. And, but, you know, the stuff that I write from the heart sells. And I learned that very quickly. Uh, you know, the, the scripts that I sold to uh, Seven Days, literally was when I started there, right? The script that I sold to Seven Days, you know, remember that TV show's concept was they had this government agent they could send back in time seven days after some kind of major disaster happened? And the, the idea that I pitched on the phone that I wrote in two days uh, was that someone, you know, stuff for Allah, someone blows up the Dome of the Rock in Al-Aqsa Mosque, right? Uh, hmm. And in Jerusalem, and that leads to a massive Middle Eastern war and a nuclear attack. And then they send the hero back in time, and he works with the Mossad agent. And you discover that the, that there's a conspiracy, and it's not what you think it is that's happening there, you know, in Jerusalem. And so I wrote that from the heart. You know, they you know they had never really done anything like that, They'd, but they bought it because it came from the heart, right? And hmm. you know, 
I, when I came to LA, my first intention was I don't want to become the Muslim guy because I realized there were almost nobody of our, of our community was really succeeding. There were quite a few of us out here and mm. I had just broken in and I was like, you know, I knew that the last thing you want to be is a lightning rod. I got to, you know, I've left behind a secure career as a lawyer. I got to get in the stable ground and be non-controversial until I can pay my rent. But then I discovered that the only things that would move my career forward was Islamic material. You know, I would write other stuff and it wouldn't sell. And then I wrote a script on uh, on the Crusades from the point of view of Salahuddin, right? You know, right? I wrote it right after September 11th. And then that script got a lot of attention. It didn't ultimately sell because it was too controversial for Hollywood, but it got a lot of attention and it launched my career. From that script, I got my job on Twilight Zone. And then while I was working on Twilight Zone, I wrote this uh, – epic on the love story of the Taj Mahal. I wanted to tell the story of Shah Jahan like Gladiator, not like a Bollywood film, because it is that epic scale, right? And I wrote it like Gladiator, like a Western epic, uh, but it happened to take place in Mughal, India. I sold that to Warner Brothers, and I was like, again, I kept trying to do non-Islamic things. I just wanted to not be a lightning rod. But subhanAllah, that's the stuff that kept my career moving. Um, and... Uh, at, at what point does, does Sleeper Cell happen? Sleeper Cell happens in 2005. Uh, now, it, I just gave you the basic events that happened. You know, I, I moved to L.A. Uh, I, got onto, I got onto the Twilight Zone. Uh, and then I sold the Taj Mahal script, which was my first feature to sell to a, to a movie studio. And then after that, the, you know, so I was like, okay, I'm having some success here. I'm making it, right? But then, inevitably, as this town is, right, I, the next two years I struggle. You know, I keep getting small work. Uh, that just keeping me able to pay my rent, you know, every two or three months, I'm desperate again, and another, another project comes, and I can pay my rent for another three months, right? And that went on for two more years. So from 2003 to 2005, I was, you know, you know, in a bad financial situation, just scraping by. I wasn't able to build on my initial success. And then in 2005, the TV show Sleeper Cell was greenlit by Showtime. And, uh, and they had read one of my writing samples that I'd written, which was a sample of the practice, the legal show. Because, you know, I was a lawyer. I thought maybe I can use my legal skills to get a legal show. You know, I'd written a sample of, of Law and Order, which was very a generic sort of Law and Order crime episode. And then wrote a sample of the, of the practice, which had this Islamic theme material, which was about a Muslim imam who was being held by, remember those secret evidence laws in the early 2000s before September 11? That right. was the most controversial thing before the Patriot Act, right? So, you know, I'd written <laughs> that. Okay. They were like, oh, it can't get worse than this, right? So I'd written that based on those laws there. And mm. again, this Islamic themed material got in front of the, uh, got in front of the producers of Sleeper Cell, the creators. They read it. They're like, this guy really understands Islam really well. He understands the legal system. They brought me in. And because the show is about a, a Muslim who's an FBI agent who infiltrates Al Qaeda. And, uh, you know, and so alhamdulillah, I was able to get onto the show. And, and I think I made an impact with that. So. Well, now you say you made an impact. Can can you tell us about that? In 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 what way do you feel you made an impact? Well, you know, the show was the first time you're ever going to have a uh, a Muslim uh, hero, not just like the the sidekick or the buddy, you know, the nameless, faceless, happy Muslim guy who gets killed as the hero goes to charge him. Right? It's this was a show that was going to be about uh, a about a Muslim, an African-American man who was a, who's a devout Muslim, who was raised in America. He's not even an immigrant like me, you know. He's a third-generation Muslim, African-American, but who had joined the FBI. And, and because he was Muslim, he was able to successfully convince these al-Qaeda guys that he was on their side, and then and he was able to infiltrate them. And so my presence there, I think, was able to give an actual insight as to how the, you know, what Muslims really think like. And, you know, there, there would be moments because, again, People can write about other cultures and religions. They can write as honestly as they can, but it's an observer's perspective, right? And they would be often startled in the writer's room when I would say, yeah, the character wouldn't think like that because this is how Muslims approach things in their inner lives. And that's not something you can read from an intro to Islam book that you use as research, you know? And so I think, especially an episode I did that's still getting me a lot of, uh, you know, positive responses now, years later, almost seven years later, um, there was an episode I wrote called The Scholar, which was the fourth episode of the first season, which was an entire episode dedicated to a, a Muslim uh, imam who is debating a terrorist, who is a terrorist is quoting Quran and Hadith to justify what he's doing. And right. the imam is able to show him using traditional Islamic scholarship why he's completely lying about what the Holy Quran is saying about war mm -hmm. and about the, the laws of war and violence and what is acceptable and what is haram. And the, terror, the, the imam wins the debate, the terrorist 
is defeated in the debate. And, and ultimately, you know, since it's a cop show, there's a lot of violence and death in the episode. But, <laughs> but the core of the episode was this debate that mm-hmm. struck people because they'd never seen on television a debate about what the Holy Quran says. And they're never. I mean, going down to ayats and, and verses and how the Al-Qaeda guys are, are, are lying about what the Quran actually says. And the anti-Muslim bigots use those lies to say that's what the Quran says, right? Yeah. And so, you know, I think only a Muslim could have written that episode. And, and a lot of people mm-hmm. emailed me saying, I learned more about Islam in this one hour of a TV show of a drama than I've learned in 20 years of watching the news. What was your perspective when you were asked to get involved in that? Because, I mean, obviously at, at that stage, this is this is post 9-11, but beyond that, it's, you know, we're talking about Hollywood has had a long history of portraying Muslims in you know, not not with the most texture and nuance. So, so you're asked to involve, be involved in a show that's about infiltrating terrorists. Uh, what what was what was your initial uh, thought process as you got involved in that? Well, before I answer that, let me actually talk for a second about the the process of how Hollywood has represented Muslims. It's actually mm-hmm. gone through a couple of different stages before we got to where we are today. The first stage actually was not hostile. We Muslims are so used to thinking that Hollywood has been is hostile to Islam. The early stages of movies, going back to the silent films until uh, I would say uh, the 60s, a very positive but magical portrayal of Muslims. The Muslims are the magical other. Everything from you know Rudolph Valentino and the Sheik to the Arabian Nights movies, and you know we're seen as positive heroic figures that are magical and otherworldly, and you know and very strange and different, but not bad guys necessarily, right? And so, like the thief of Baghdad, you know, these heroic Muslim guys, there's always a Muslim, you know, it's always like the Arab vizier villain, right? But it's generally the positive portrayals. Then in the 60s, you see, actually really in the 70s, it's really in the 70s you started this moment where you started having the Muslim hijacker, right? Because there really were, you know, there was a lot of Palestinian you know, airplane hijacking at the time because they thought that was the way to, to bring attention to, to their situation. And so that became... The, uh, the the representation, and then it got worse in the 80s, where you had the Iranian Revolution and all the chaos that was happening in Lebanon at the time. And so suddenly, Islam, you know, they didn't, you know, it went from being this magical, mystical thing to this very violent and, and, and dangerous thing. And of course, after September 11th, it just made things even worse, right? So that was the flow. But you are right that it was never nuanced. It was always either magical, mysterious, to deadly and dangerous, to what do we do now, right? And that's where Sleeper Cell came in. And you know, to the credit of the gentleman who created the show, uh, Ethan Rip and Cyrus Voris, they really wanted to do a show that was sophisticated and that looked at the issues, the politics, and the emotional, psychological situation of what makes somebody become a suicide bomber or join uh, Al Qaeda, which is essentially a death cult, right? Mm-hmm. What makes someone do that? And you know, they had, and they they they, they differed politically. One was very right wing, one was very left wing, and that was good for the show because we had different political views from the bosses, right? But they they wanted to understand these characters, even if they didn't sympathize with them or like them, and mm-hmm. so. When I saw that that was their intention, I was very excited to be involved. You know, Muslims actually initially, when they heard I was involved in the show, were very hostile. They're like, you're going to perpetuate even more negative images. And I said, no, I think you need to watch a show. We are going to show these Al-Qaeda guys because they really are out there. <laughs> but you're going to see for the first time what might motivate these guys. And, you know, and then you're going to see a real Muslim fighting them from an authentic place of Iman and faith. And so, you know, that's why I tackled it. You know, it really is, it's still to this day, in my opinion, was a revolutionary show and remains a revolutionary show because I think after that, there was a brief moment after that where you started seeing positive portrayals of Muslims and even 24 started adjusting. 24 was a big show that existed when we first arrived, right? And the mm-hmm. first few seasons, it was just cartoonish villainous Muslims, right? And then after Sleeper Cell, you began to notice on 24, they started having nuanced, sophisticated Muslim characters to the end, by the end, where Jack Bauer is turning to a Muslim imam to, for absolution, right? <laughs> you know, that's a journey. And I know we impacted it because we added to the debate about Muslim portrayals. And then, you know, after 24, we sort of went right back to uh, Muslim villains. <laughs> so mm-hmm. that's where we are again now. <laughs> and that's, that's, you know, I think... So, so, so uh, go ahead, Pramit. I was yeah. just going to say, what I find interesting is that in the history that you were talking about of Hollywood and their portrayal of Muslims... Um, what I think is 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 new, and and I think what you brought and your story, vis-a-vis Sleeper Cell, sort of de- demonstrates is the fact that Muslims now are being asked to, uh, you know, be a part of the, be a, be a part of the narrative 
Do you know what I mean? So, so even if you look at the periods of, of you know, the, the exotic Muslim or the terrorist Muslim, it was always, you know, someone else portraying Islam or portraying right. Muslims. Ob- observer's point of view. Yeah. Exactly. And so what's unique now or what's happening now, and, and, and like you said, I think Sleeper Style really sort of sets the stage for that, is Muslims now being, you know, part of the process, being part yeah. of the creative process yeah, and definitely. telling their stories from their own point of view. Yeah, I mean, you know, we have my friend uh, Samir Gurdesi was uh, a uh, he's a Pakistani guy, brilliant comedy writer. He's and my cousin. He, I, I had no idea that you were related. <laughs> Wonderful, he's a, he's a really good guy. And, uh, and he, Samir was Samir was someone I was mentoring, uh, you know, when he was a young writer. And alhamdulillah, he just took off and he has his own career established by himself, right? So I can't take all the credit for that, but I'm proud that I knew him when he was when in his early stages. But Samir, as you know, was a writer on the show uh, Aliens in America, which is about a Pakistani immigrant, again, a, a development forward, Pakistani immigrant k- kid who's trying to figure out what it's like to be in America. And Samir, being a Pakistani immigrant, was able to share that perspective. So yeah, so that's part of the shift is happening because there is there is a shift on the producer's side. They want more sophisticated storytelling. And yeah. now because there are Muslims who are taking the risks and coming into this industry, they mm-hmm. have a pool to turn to because they don't have a pool. What difference does it make? Was that pool there before 9-11 or do you think that there's there were been people no? Here, they've been struggling, you know, okay. you know, and they were out here. Uh, we have some very successful Muslims who are not known as necessarily Muslim writers because they focus on broad storytelling. Uh, someone I really, really admire and you know, have great respect for is a devout Muslim, you know, uh, Mara Akhil and her husband, uh, Salim. They are devout Muslims and they're very strong in Hollywood. They, they've risen up in the African-American comedy world. Uh, Mara created Girlfriends. I mean, that was a very successful show. Here you have a devout Muslim woman. You know, when I go to their house, mashallah, I'm just humbled. I'm like, you know, they are sincere, real Muslims. But mm. most people in this industry, when I talk to people, don't know that they're Muslims because they don't wear it on their sleeve. They don't need to for their career. They've got a successful career in the in the world of, of African American urban storytelling, where you know, being they don't have to wear on their head that I'm Muslim, right? right. Or Dave Chappelle I, or any of those. Exactly, Dave Chappelle, perfect example, right? Yeah. I mean, they are. They are. They don't have to wear it on their head. And mashallah, they're very successful and they're good people. And then you know. You get uh, someone like me who's a little bit of an idiot. I've made myself a lightning rod. I've put myself into this. Again, because I told you, the universe almost forced me to. Every time I try to write non Islamic themed stuff, nothing happens. And mm. then I write this Islamic themed stuff, something happens. And, I, and then it makes me more of a lightning rod because the other side of it is the, the, there is a very real a backlash beginning amongst the more anti Muslim bigoted forces because it's not just, the, yes, a lot of the negative portrayal was coming from just ignorance of the observer effect. We just don't understand. Yeah. Some of it was coming from people with political agendas that have right. issues about, you know, Muslims in general or Muslims about, you know, they have Israel-Palestine issues or whatever, and they see the rise of Muslims in the media as threatening to the narratives they want to tell. Uh, and so, yes, there are very real anti-Muslim bigots in positions of real power, and that's the dark side of what's happening now is that you're beginning to see an actual increased conscious effort to inc- create more negative programming about Muslims to respond to this because there's a fear that we're beginning to change the narrative, even though it's been a couple of things, but it's already terrifying people with those agendas. Right. Now, I mean, I think an interesting conversation yeah. taking place within the Muslim community is on the one hand, you have people, like you said, you have the Dave Chappelle's of the world who are engaging with, uh, in, 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 you know, in, in his particular case, comedy in a mainstream setting, right? Mm-hmm. And then you have, I don't want, you know, not dropping names here, but other comedians who cater specifically to a very narrow Muslim audience, right? right? And so they they both have value. I mean, you need the Muslims need to see the Muslim guys who are telling their stories as well. You need that because, you know, we're so isolated in some ways in the media world. We feel like no one's hearing our stories or, or, you know, and so I think you need those guys too. Okay. So you're saying there's merit in both approaches as opposed to picking one or the other. Yeah, there's merit in both approaches because right now, you know, the, the tragedy of where the Muslims are because we have... It's a self-created tragedy. We have abdicated for a hundred years involvement in modern media. I mean, we have abdicated it. We have it developed in every other technical field in the world except this. You know, in our own countries, yes, in, in, the, in the Muslim world, you know, in, in Dubai, you've got a lot of great programming coming out. You've got good stuff coming out of, you know, great dramas coming out of Pakistan. The Bollywood film industry is heavily Muslim. But when it comes to Western media, which is controlling Americans and Westerners' perceptions of Islam and actually feeding its foreign and military policy. We have mm-hmm. You know, the mm-hmm. generation that, that I come from, our parents didn't even think of it as a possibility. Right. And so we have had 
two generations of time lost where mm-hmm. Muslim shopping evolved. And I can I can quote that because we have you know we had you know my friends who are Indian Hindus have you know, their community has been involved in Hollywood going back into the eighties. Right, you have very successful Indian Hindu uh, producers here who've done really great work and. You know, they're actually lauded and respected by their community. There is not a pathology. There is the standard fear, I think, all this is have of you're going down an insecure artistic path. But there isn't a backlash. Like, why are you doing this? It's not halal. Like, we have that. We have people say, don't get involved in Hollywood because it's haram. I've actually had that mm-hmm. said to me. And mm-hmm. we don't have – there are Muslims holding themselves back and holding each other back in the media, which is a tragedy. Mm. And I mean, what, what do you attribute that that abdication to? I mean, I mean, part of it you said is is just cultural norms. Part of it is is uh, fear, I suppose. I mean, uh, well, I mean, I think it's it's it's. Um, I think we are still more than any other community on the planet. We are still coming out of the out of the psychological scars of decolonization. Mm-hmm. We have lost our self esteem as an ummah, yes. right? You know, more than any other community. I mean, India went through massive colonization and look at it now I mean, it just launched a, a, a probe to mars right it found itself it, it had its missteps throughout the 20th century right but it found its self-confidence now and in 2013 and the muslim world we're still basket cases because we're still we're facing the shock of the one thing we never expected which is the europeans these guys who from our perspective couldn't read or write and understand, you know, you know, living in stone huts when the Muslims were the world's grandest civilization would conquer us, take control of our schools, humiliate us, take out, you know, a sense of Islamic pride, uh, which is actually intentionally done. If you, if you study the history of colonization, uh, they studied, you know, the British and French colonialists studied the, the Inquisition. I've actually recently done a project it's a set in the days of the Inquisition. And, you know, they studied how the, the Spanish in, in, inquisitors actually stamped out Islam from Iberia. They realized that the only way to do that was when they took Muslim towns, uh, because people would see, continue to secretly practice Islam even if they were forced to convert to Catholicism. They would secretly practice it in their in their homes. So the only way to end this was they would take control of the schools and start doing propaganda and brainwashing about how evil Islam was and just make up stories. So ch- entire children were being raised with false stories of Islam to humiliate them so that they would stop practicing the religion privately in their homes. So the w- French colonialists and the British colonialists studied that because it worked, right? Mm-hmm. They studied it, and they said when they, we take the Muslim countries after World War, well, in India a little bit earlier, but after World War I uh, for the most part in the Middle East, they took over the schools, and they took out all traditional Islamic uh, knowledge education, and as a result, you saw all the anti-colonial movements were all Western-based. They were all Marxist-based, right? Because that's the only ideology they had with Marx were Western thinking. So we Muslims are coming out of a, uh, a intentionally planned period of loss of sense and identity. And so that's where we are very lost. And the anti-Muslim bigots in the media need us to stay out of it. Because the moment we come in and start telling stories that will bring back Muslim pride, it ends that agenda. The last two centuries of Islam has been humiliation internally from Muslims because they've been fed a false story by their colonizers. And the Muslims have absorbed it. And they now see themselves as barbarians and as backwards people. That's one of the reasons the media is so frightening to them because it's like holding this ugly mirror to your face, right? And and then they have to work out all those pathologies. I know that's a deep psychological explanation, but I'm speaking from the heart. I really believe it goes down to that level. Right. Sort of communities have this kind of fear of media like Muslims do. Yeah, no, it's a community coming out of trauma, right? It's just like any other psychological trauma, and, and we're going to go through all the various stages of recovering from that trauma. So, mm-hmm. uh, yeah, I couldn't agree with you more. Um, but I, mean, I don't know if you want to shift focus to move your more well, well, I mean, literary. Uh, well, I, and I, yeah, and I, I definitely want to talk about. <clears throat> excuse me, I definitely want to talk about uh, the novels that you've worked on. But, but before we move, move on to that, um, what do you, I mean? What do you think? the the Muslim community should be looking to do as it sort of branches out now into media uh, involvement. I mean, we're definitely seeing, you know, you're kind of a, a leading edge of, of a trend that I would say in the past 10 years. You say happened. leading edge, I say lightning rod, because I feel the pain. <laughs> <laughs> well, well the first ball. one through the wall always gets hurt, right? I That's a bad job, brother. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, we're definitely seeing seeing a lot more involvement, uh, not just in terms of Muslims specifically in the media, but also uh, more attempts to to show sort of the, the to to depict those nuances. I mean, we we are a far uh, very much a field of you know the Delta Force, 
with Chuck Norris and those guys. I mean, I mean, that is, I would argue that that's a film that you would not see today. No, you won't see that. What you will see are uh, what appear to be more sophisticated tellings of the stories, right? Uh, but they still have, you know, either misunderstandings or intentional misrepresentations behind the sophistication, right? You'll have dramas that show, you know, Muslim dictators and, you know, and you'll see what appear to be a sophisticated understanding of the politics of the countries only to discover that there are some intentional choices being made. Now, I'm just being, I'm being a little cautious in what I say because, you know, there's a lot of people I know in this town who are working on projects that are coming out that I think will be very damaging for the Muslims. And I think those projects are being developed, um, intentionally to to thwart whatever gains we've had. And I think Muslims are going to be shocked by some of the stuff that's about to come out in the next two years because I see the scripts. And it shocks me because they're sophisticated and intelligent, but they are also very specifically bigoted. It's, it's done with people who actually know the material and are making choices, right, about what they show. And again, the reason I'm just being cautious is that you know, there, I have so many enemies as it is. I don't need to add more. I think when the material comes out, you'll, uh, you'll see for yourselves what it is, and, mm-hmm. and we can talk about it then. But but yeah, that's that's coming, and that's mm-hmm. unfortunate, and it's real, and that's why the Muslims now have to get more active because even a little bit of movement forward has caused this fear within the system that you know there's there, there's an entire military industrial complex invested in keeping us at war in the Middle East and in Pakistan. There's an entire political structure that keeps our foreign policy towards Israel and the Palestinians exactly in place, and that's all fed by a propaganda machine. The moment there's any chips in that propaganda, it's a house of cards. It collapses. And mm-hmm. so you see very strong efforts to demonize Muslims, but not in the Chuck Norris way, in very sophisticated shows that are going to make you, you go, wow, that was very intelligent, but why do I feel sick inside after watching it? <laughs> well, I, you know, I, I kind of liken it to some of the talking heads you see mm-hmm. on popular news programs mm-hmm. where they're Muslim by name or they're so-called reformed terrorists, right? Yeah. And so you think, oh, wow, they're going to tell a nice story. But at the end of the day, you know, the, the narrative is the same, right? It's, it's, it's know, propaganda, that. but it's done at it's the It's propaganda, that's right. And, but like you said, it's now with a more sophisticated edge, so it's more yeah, so, effective. And so, yeah, so the, as a result, the Muslims now more than ever – have mm-hmm. to get involved because people like me and Samir and, and the handful of us that are out there have stirred the pot and it's annoyed the system and maybe mm-hmm. that was dangerous but somebody had to do it. Now now they're coming back and as a result, the stage the Muslims are in right now is that there's a lot of people out here in, in LA and I say LA because you got to be here. I mean mm-hmm. you really have to be here to influence Hollywood. Yeah, you can do some of it from New York. It's, if you want to influence Hollywood, you've got to be in Los Angeles in the game here, right? And there's a lot of Muslims out here. They're still on the outskirts, the peripheries. They're still – they're not even aiming to be higher than that. And there's a handful that's, that are beginning to get to the next level of the periphery. We have to have Muslims aiming to be studio heads. We don't have that yet because you know it's like this. When I started off as a journalist in, in, in the early 90s, there were very few Muslim journalists. Every time I do, I was like the first Muslim guy and then the lightning rod, right? So that, having that as a journalist when I was like 1990s, I was writing as a journalist. And – now, there's a lot of Muslim uh, journalists, but as what I learned in journalism working there was that it's not the journalist that has the power. It's the editor because you can write whatever you want. They don't have to publish it or they can change it, right? Mm-hmm. And then your name's attributed to it. And so the Muslims have now – the stage we went to is we now have a bunch of Muslim journalists, and that's wonderful, both in print, online, and uh, in television. But we don't have a lot of Muslim decision makers amongst the editorial boards and amongst the media companies. And so a lot of the best work and reporting is being suppressed by the decision makers because Muslims are, again, aiming – we are still – because we're, we're figuring this out and we're coming out of the trauma that, that you rightfully mentioned. We are still aiming for the bandage. We're not looking at the actual disease. And so after – Muslims now, the next generation, has to say, look, the only way this is going to change is if we, if we as a community start valuing media to the point that we are telling our children – a Muslim should aim to become the head of HBO. Hmm. Right? That's, we're not even doing that yet. We're, we're resisting telling a Muslim to become a writer or an actor. Right? But writers, actors, directors, they don't have a lot of power. The, the power is in the hands of the guys who control the actual distribution channel. You know, and, and no one, we're not even trying to be at that level. And that's right. where a lot of the great work is being suppressed. What do you um, what do you think of or have been some of the more positive portrayals of Muslims? Just uh, you know, let, let's just sort of uh, say in the in the in the post nine eleven era. I mean, not, notwithstanding sleeper cell, uh, what are some things that you think of as as steps in the right direction? 
Well, I mean, I think we've already mentioned them. I mean, I thought I thought what Samir did, you know, with Aliens America was was a step in the right direction. But it's it's a shame that show didn't last longer. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it it is what it is. But it's uh, it's, you know, honestly, I I can't say there's a lot because we're still we're still stuck at the level of the stock character on the side, right? And right. so, you know, I we I wish we've already listed the shows that I mean, Twenty Four started showing positive Muslim characters, Sleeper Cell, and the Aliens America, and you know, it's it's just not important right now. To, uh, to the storytellers. So, you know, there's been a handful of episodes. I work on the show Nikita. I love that show. They did a couple of really good episodes where there were Muslim characters and they did a, a sophisticated thing. But the show was about Nikita, this hot girl running around who was an assassin, right? Was, and so they, you know, they had no real agenda to have Muslim characters. If it happened to fall in the storyline of episode, you know, 24, it would right. appear there, right? And so, so they're out there, but, you know, it's still, the, you're not seeing any real... Muslims as real human beings, storytelling coming around. Aliens in America was a beginning. Um, you know, we will get to the next stage through comedy, I think, and then eventually when you have just a drama where the character is Muslim and it's not about politics and it's not about religion, it's not about, it's just the character happens to be Muslim. You know, it took a long time. It's funny because the Jewish community has been very heavily involved in Hollywood since the beginning, and yet it, even that community, it took a long time for its portrayal on television to change. Now it's very normal to have Jewish characters who just have me Jewish and nobody even comments on it. Right? Right. It's just there, right? And the Friends, I think, was a major part of it because they were Jewish Ross characters. Ross and Monica. And you don't even think about it, right? It has nothing right. to do with anything. In the 70s, it was like Archie Bunker meets a Jew. Wow, that's like a special episode, right? <laughs> that's, that's the log line. A, a Jew yeah. comes to dinner, right? So it, it, yeah, yeah, so it takes time, right? And that that's a community that, you know, that has been successful in, the, in this industry sure. since the earliest stages, but they felt that the American public wasn't ready for them to be shown in a more mainstream way. We Muslims are desperately shown in a mainstream way. We have no power, <laughs> so it doesn't matter. Well, what about um, you know? One thing I always think of is uh, in Zero Dark Thirty, yeah. uh-huh. uh, the Captain Bigelow film. Uh, mm-hmm. We have one of the heads of the CIA is. He's a Muslim, yeah. Muslim is, and he's, he's a he's a, a Caucasian, normal, and he's one of the establishment. And it's it's they don't hang Subtle. a lampshade on it. Yeah, it's Subtle. just oh, and by the way, he's Muslim. Yeah, because well, he's yeah. Very yeah. Right. I actually yeah. like that. I like that film a lot. And you know, it's like you and I have talked about this in the past. It's just you know, unfortunately, a lot of Muslims reacted to that film without having seen it because it just became this thing they wanted. They they, they wrote lots of Facebook posts and articles and reviews and without actually having watched the movie. Mm-hmm. I was like. Because they're like, it just became this thing that they, this icon that they could talk about their issues about drone warfare and everything else. They'll just watch the damn movie. And the movie is actually, you know, the movie is an intense movie. And I was surprised by moments like this where, you know, one of the characters, a CIA guy, and this is based on true story. And I, and I actually, they've identified who the character is that the Muslim character is based on. It's a real guy. He was a Muslim convert at, who heads the actual who headed the Bin Laden task force, he's the head intelligence agent within the CIA. And he's a Muslim convert, he prays. I mean, they show that in the movie. He, the guy walks in, he's doing his, his salat on the floor. And, and, he, and that's just there. Nobody comments on it. The other characters in the CIA don't care that their boss is this white guy who's a practicing Muslim, right? They're just trying to do their jobs. And that was actually a major step forward. And when I, when I commented that on Facebook, I was hit by attacks left and right from, you know, you have thousands of Facebook friends that don't really know you. And I was just getting <laughs> personal attacks, you know, of, of de- decrying my character, my iman, my patriotism, my morality. Because like, how can you even support this film? And, you know, I said, did you watch it? And you don't even know me. You're, you're declaring me this horrible Muslim for just saying I'm glad that this character who – they're revealing to the American audience that this is not actually a war against Islam. The head of the in, the unit that found Bin Laden is a white Muslim, right? And that's a historical fact, and they revealed it without making any comments about it because because this guy obviously doesn't believe that what Al Qaeda represents is what Islam represents. Now, one can take issue with the choices that President Obama then made with that information and how that raid was done and. You know, the consequences of that, one can absolutely raise issues because they show it in the movie. You know, and there's actually great moments in that movie. That's why I really have respect for Captain Bigelow. You know, you've seen the movies, like, you remember that moment where at the very end with the horrific raid and they're just, they, I mean, the, 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 you know, these guys, Seal Team Six, are just taking out anybody that moves, right? And right. so they, they gun down women without any problem, right? And yeah. then there's this Muslim, uh, basically a Pakistani soldier. I mean, he's, he's, a, he's a guy who's clearly a Pakistani Muslim working with the, with the, with the, with the Seal Team Six. And he's guiding them through the maze. 
And he's coming across these bodies of non-combatants, women that have been shot in the stomach and are dying in front of him. And the, the Bigelow just looks at the camera on his face and he's not cool with it. He's yeah. here to get this guy, but you see the look on his face. He's like, why are you shooting these women? They didn't do anything. But his face says it all. That's great filmmaking. The Muslims who attack the film and then attack me for commenting on it, never realize she's actually making a comment there. This isn't a good thing. Mm -hmm. You know, what are we becoming to get this guy? She made the comment without holding up a play card that says, what are we becoming to, become, to get this guy, right? <laughs> but that's good filmmaking. And again, this is because Muslims are still stuck at this victim mindset that they couldn't actually see someone who was trying to promote a more sophisticated view without the anti-Muslim agenda. They couldn't see it. That's right. No, and it, and it very much is a victim mentality, like you said. I think I think you said it best. Uh, so so now, as as we kind of uh, move forward here, obviously uh, you've you've made the transition to, to writing a couple novels, and and you talk about being a lightning rod. Now now uh, you you wrote a book called Mother of the Believers, which is about uh, the rise of Islam as portrayed from a first person perspective, mm -hmm. uh, uh, the first person perspective of uh, Prophet Muhammad's wife, uh, peace be upon him. Uh, First of all, how did you decide that that was the way you wanted to tell that story? And second, uh, tell us about the reaction to that, because I'm, I'm sure you have some very interesting stories to tell. I got lots of stories. Well, let me, let me actually show you. I got a copy of the book here, so I'll hold it up to the screen and you can see it. This is, this is the book, Mother of the Believers. I'm very proud of it. It's one of my two novels. Uh, it's, you know, and the novel is about Hazrat Aisha, anha, and as you said, it's told from her point of view. Um, as a memoir on her deathbed, right? As she, as she tells her nephew the story of her life. And the reason I want, I've always wanted to do the story. I've actually, it's one of those things where I had a fantasy as a little child. Like, I wish someone would tell the story. When I would read these stories about Hazrat Aisha, when in the, as a child, and hear them in the, in the, the, in the, the, the masjid or, uh, in Brooklyn or, or just read books, and you're like, this is an incredible story. She's an incredible woman. And I always wanted to tell the story. And so by the mercy of Allah, I've actually been able to publish it. And, and it's out and it's doing well. Alhamdulillah. But, you know, this, the reason I wanted to focus on her is that Aisha radiallahu anha in her self in her, is this complex human being mm -hmm. who single-handedly shatters every stereotype, negative stereotype that people have about Islam and its, and its relationship with women. Because, you know, she's this powerful woman, strong-willed. You know, she ends up being a religious scholar, a jurist, a political leader. You know, she's a poet. And ultimately, she ends up becoming a military leader. She leads armies into Iraq in the first Muslim civil war. And... You know, and she's the one the Prophet ﷺ, uh, loved the most. He died in her arms. And that says something about this woman who, you know, who is no little wilting flower. And so in her life, you're like, okay, every image you have about the oppressed Muslim woman is shattered by this woman who is our mother, right? And so I want to tell the story. And, and, you know, by God's grace, I was able to get this published. And, you know, of course, the standard thing, if, if the first initial reaction was before, when the book was just first announced, before even anyone read it, started getting the standard, you know, angry emails from Muslims saying, you're a kafir, you're, an, you're, you're a Mossad agent pretending to be a Muslim, right? And you're trying to corrupt our religion. And, you know, I, I, unfortunately, I even got death threats, real death threats, like the ones where I had to get the FBI involved. Okay, here, they identify who the guy was. And, I mean, it's, it's, it's heartbreaking because, you know, these, really this, is. Is the, this is the low, cheap behavior that the enemies of Islam attribute to us. And then they do it, right? <laughs> and then they, they actually do yeah, it. Yeah, and so, it yeah, yeah, it broke my heart. And I had to, the initial stages were actually heartbreaking because before I got positive responses, I got much negativity. And mm -hmm. unfortunately, that's been my entire career. Everything I try to do for Islam, the first response is Muslims being negative towards it before it even comes out. And I, in my opinion, that comes from this victim mindset. It comes from this misguided rage they have towards feeling powerless in the media. So they assume any Muslim that is succeeding in the media must have sold his soul to do so and mm -hmm. must be trying to corrupt the religion. And so they release it onto me every time. It happened at Sleeper Cell, it happened with my books. Every project I do, the first thing is a negative response from Muslims. Then, with time, people actually watch the show or read the book and they get the material. And then I start getting positive, supportive comments. And alhamdulillah, the book has done very well. Uh, it's in its second printing now. And it continues to sell primarily through word of mouth. You know, people uh, recommend it to their friends, and then they read it. And I'm still to this day getting emails. It's been out now four years. I'm, the, I'm still to this day getting emails from my website, you know, from people all over the world who are telling me this book made me fall in love with Islam again. Maybe I didn't realize how incredible the story was. Because I follow, I, I hew pretty strictly to the Sira. you know. I just presented it from Aisha's point of view. And, yeah, and so that, and so I wanted people to realize the story of the, the Prophet of his life is incredible, and they don't know it. Well, they don't know, actually know how incredible it is. And so, you know, it's, it's, you just get through these barriers to keep going.
Yeah, I mean, I, I'd be curious in terms of your preparation and, and mm-hmm. some of the research that you probably had to do or you did for the book. I mean, how was that process? Well, I mean, I'd like I said, I've been wanting to do this book for a while, and you know, I had actually written a, a manuscript of another novel first. Uh, it was back. It was the Crusade script I told you about that launched my career, got me onto onto Twilight Zone. Nobody at the time bought it because they were afraid of us telling the story of the Crusades from a Muslim point of view, from Salahuddin's point of view, was the hero, the Crusade is the villain. So I was so upset that it got all this attention and all this praise, and no one bought the script that I then novelized that script. And it's actually the second novel that's published called Shadow of the Swords. Right. And it tells, yeah, it tells the story of the Crusades from Salahuddin's point of view. So that um, manuscript I had, I had written it in 2003, and it took me four years of rejection by publishers before Simon & Schuster read that manuscript and then gave me a two-book deal and asked me what other book did I want to write. And they said, well, you know, I pitched them a bunch of ideas, and the moment they heard Mother of the Believer, I said, telling the story of Aisha. They said, we want to do this. In fact, you know what? Let's put that book out first. I'm like, we, we, I haven't written it yet. <laughs> you have this other book. You've got this Crusades book. Just put that out, and then give me time to write this other one. They're like, no, no, we, want, we think this is the one. And so you, you, got, you got six months to do it. And I was like, are you kidding me? But they're like, that's the deal, right? And so, alhamdulillah. Because I had been obsessed with Aisha Radhanana and her life and the story, I had been researching it for a decade. I had massive, you know, database of material, you know, uh, of, of her life. And, you know, it's it really, the problem was there was too much of it. Mm-hmm. The original draft of Mother of the Believers, I locked myself up. And in six months, I wrote a well over 1,000-page draft. The current draft is about 600 pages, right? I wrote a 1,000-page draft and handed it to my publishers, you know, completely exhausted. And I kept out, I mean, I was maybe able to use 20% of the actual research material that I had about her life, right, to do a thousand page draft. And they're like, this is too big. We, we got to edit this. And they ended up taking out 40% of that book, and that's the one that's been published, right? So, alhamdulillah, the research was not the problem. In fact, what, you know, what I discovered was that in doing the research, there's these incredible stories from the earliest Islamic sources that, you know, they'll blow your mind away, that Muslims don't even talk about today, that show the incredible courage and the humanity of the Sahaba. You know, the thing is, part of our brainwashing from colonialism is that we now treat Islam like British treated Christianity in the 19th century, you know, the Victorian Islam, that's what we have. And so we, it's not even authentic Islam, it's this fake Islam that that tries to mimic Christianity in the 19th century in in London, right? And so it's this thing where we can't talk about the humanity of the Sahaba, and all, you know, and any mistakes they made, you know, because they're saints. That's how Christians, or at least 19th century, you know, Anglican Christians treated their religion. And so we do that. And what I found was the Islamic sources always treated the Sahaba as human beings. It honors them for all the incredible things they did, and it shows their faults without any embarrassment, without any apology, because they're human. Because if they weren't human, you should worship them. Right. You know, if they if they if, if they're perfect, you should worship them. And they're not. And that's why Islam is so beautiful, because it's a religion of imperfect human beings. And God is greater than us. And he makes a religion work despite our imperfection. And mm-hmm. so I took a lot of those inc- stories I found in early I'm talking about ninth century, eighth century, well, translated from some of the early sources, but eighth, ninth century uh, documents of the of the Sahabas and the wonderful things they did and the mistakes they made. And their human errors. And I put them in this book, and people were, and I was actually nervous. I thought people would actually say, How could you say this about this major Sahaba? And I would have to point to them to the actual source and whatever. But what I was surprised by is that when people actually read the book, they're like, You know, when you tell us these stories of their mistakes and their errors and their flaws, it made me fall in love with them because they're just like us, right? And I can, I can then endeavor to be a better Muslim because they're not these icons put up like saints, like, you know, 19th century Christians did, right? You couldn't, you couldn't talk about the, the holy figures of the church in any way except in holy ways. And then you realize, wait, this is a religion for real people. And that's, I think, the benefit of the book. Uh, what, what kind of uh, crossover response have you gotten from, I mean, obviously uh-huh. uh, the, it, it elicited some controversy from, from within the Muslim community. What about yeah. from without the Muslim community? Well, you know, there was actually, it, it's, it's part of what I talk about, the, you know, the, the sense of the effort to try to stop the the positive portrayal of Muslims at the beginning. You know, Simon Schuster was very excited when they put the book out, and then they became initially very frustrated because no major newspaper would review it. And they didn't understand what was going on. New York Times declined to review it. Every major newspaper, they couldn't get anyone to review the book, even give it a bad review. You know, and th- I mean, I was getting endorsements from Amy Tan, one of the biggest selling authors in the world, from, you know, Reza Esfahan gave me a beautiful endorsement. And all these, they're like, look, this guy is, this came out of Simon Schuster with Amy Tan and Reza Esfahan endorsing the book 
and nobody wants it to even review it or look at it. And that was because exactly what it was. It was a positive portrayal of Islam, and the structure was beginning to become very threatened by it. Let me tell you a story of what happened. And this also, it ends well, because it shows the power of Allah. But when I was so frustrated that I couldn't get a single review, so at that point, Simon Schuster became discouraged, and they simply basically just decided to just dump it on the marketplace without any, uh, without any fanfare, because they couldn't get anyone to pay attention to it. And so that's when I started doing this massive campaign. That's how I started becoming a writer of the Huffington Post. I started writing articles about contemporary Muslim events and tying them into the novel, hoping that at least maybe someone will find out about the book this way because nobody wants to review it and bring attention to it. Hmm. And then what happened is I got uh, a reporter from the New York Times uh, got in touch with me saying that he wanted to interview me uh, for an article that was appearing in the Sunday Times about the future of literature, right, and about how literature was changing with the development of technology. Like, I mean, the idea was... You know, it, with the development of modern cell phones, how does Romeo and Juliet work? It doesn't, right? Because if they had cell phones, right, the story doesn't work, right? They just go, oh, baby, I'm still alive, right? I mean, that just text you, and there's no story, right? And so, like, how is the literature going to evolve with modern technology? And they wanted my opinion on it, right? And so I gave a great talk, and the wonderful thing, I was like, this is it. This is my angle. The New York Times wouldn't review the book, but I'm just about to get in this New York Times article, which was going to be published the, sun, the day before my book comes out. So I'm going to talk about my novel in this article, and then the world's going to find out about it, and I got the publicity that they denied me, right? So I'm excited. We talk about my novel in depth, and we talk about why it was easier to do a historical novel that doesn't have cell phones and modern technology and, and, you know, and all those issues. And then on Sunday, the day before my novel comes out, I go and get the New York Times. I'm excited. The, the article's there. It's, it's in the Week in Review, huge article. I'm the most extensively quoted author in there, and there's not one mention of my novel. Oh, I'm, just no. identif- I'm just identified as a TV writer. Mm. All the other authors are identified by their novels. So I was stunned. I was like, what? So I emailed a journalist. And I'm like, look, I know it's not your job to promote my book, but this is that's all we talked about. So right. all of my, my quotes are out of context because there's no context that I'm a novelist, and the book is coming out tomorrow. That's newsworthy, right? And he emailed me back saying, you know, I have to apologize. I have no idea what happened. Obviously, I discussed your novel in my article. The editor took it out. Wow. No uh, kidding. New York Times. The editor took out references to my book because they did not want to bring attention to it. That's a choice. It doesn't make any sense to say, okay, it's just word length problem, right? This is an article about literature where you're identifying novelists. I know one random TV writer who doesn't seem to have any connection to it, right? That's an intentional choice because they did not want to bring attention to the book. Those are political choices at the New York Times. Right. Hmm. Those are real. And the more I've gotten further into Hollywood, I've come across more and more of this in your face, you know, manipulation, because people, Muslims love conspiracy theories. We all, we all. And then you realize, oh, my God, there really are conspiracies because <laughs> we, we have all these crazy conspiracy theories. And then you get in front of this thing and then you see what they what they do. And you realize there really are conspiracies. Sure. And it was hard. Oh, and and, and you, you mentioned Reza Aslan. And obviously yeah. he went through a little bit of that recently yes. this past summer with his book yeah. about Jesus. Mm hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, of course, Fox News sort of ended up turning his book into a bestseller. Yeah, so. yeah, which is, which is, you know, Reza, Reza's a friend of mine. He's very intelligent and he's very media savvy. I'm sure he probably knew, how, you know, what his audience was, and he knew going on there would get him the, the eyeballs, and he smartly did it. Um, you know, where my book ended up being, the blessing is that my my publishers gave up on it, especially when I told them what happened with this New York Times article. They're like, all right, well, you know, good luck to you. Thanks. It was nice working <laughs> with you. And then uh, we'll just put the book out. We're done with our contract. And then through word of mouth, the book ended up selling so well, they ended up, to their surprise, doing a second edition. They didn't expect it because there was no media publicity. So that is the power of Allah, that Allah literally used the grassroots word of mouth to spread the book despite these incredible efforts to stop it, right? And so, you know, there's, you know, there is that stuff. And again, maybe because I'm, I'm, a, I'm a different kind of lightning rod, I face more of these obstacles. You know, in many ways, uh, I'm, I would love to suck. I can't compare myself to him because he's one of my great heroes. But, you know, there are struggles that I face that are in the vein of what I read about in his book. Maybe read the autobiography of Malcolm X, right? He's one of my great heroes. And mm. the reason that his, he is so troubling to this day to the power structure is that he is about personal empowerment. You know, he is, he is about ending your own victimization because right now both political parties want African Americans to think of themselves as victims, right? Mm-hmm. You know, one wants to victimize them in this way, one wants to victimize them in that way. And, you know, if you read Malcolm X, his whole thing was, you know, he was actually, he was giving a very conservative Fox News thing to the, the African American media. He said, get off drugs, get off alcohol, 
keep your families together, fathers be good fathers, you know, and be involved in business and obey the law. Be, and that will be the real way to success because the system doesn't, the system wants you on welfare. It wants you drunk. Mm -hmm. And he would say these things. And actually for all the people, it's a very right wing message if you think about it. And he is so feared by right wingers today because that actually would empower the African-American community much more, right? His message. And that's not actually the message they want. So I follow on that path where I'm actually trying to empower the Muslims in a very straightforward way. And that's much more frightening than, uh, than some of the other stuff that's being done out there. Well, uh, no, I, 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 there's like, there's so many different thoughts going on yes, in my head right now, course. but there's like three, mm -hmm. three things that I really like for you to comment on. Please. Um, so in no particular order, mm -hmm. um, Seeing that, like your second book about the Crusades, mm -hmm. um, uh, was more of would you call like a historical fiction? I mean, in that there were historical. Yeah, there were more more licenses taken because I, I was very careful about taking historical licenses among the believers. That'd be much too dangerous. Yeah. Right, right. So I was going to just ask you again. You know, like going back to the question I asked you about horror films. Um, mm -hmm. You know, what were some of the inspirations? Uh, you know, had had you read like the works of like Amin Malouf and other people who? Sure. Sort of uh, yeah, written? no, all those. So yeah, Amin, Amin Malouf has his wonderful books on the, the Arab you know, Crusades. That's right. That's right. Yeah. That's why yeah. I mentioned in particular. Yeah. No. There. I mean, I've read all those books. They're actually referenced in, in you know, I uh, in in both novels. I reference my sources in a, in an author's note, and I reference Amin and many other books because uh, I've been fascinated by the Crusades and by Salahuddin. You know, the the licenses I took actually in in the Crusades book, Shadow of the Swords, were because in many ways Salahuddin. Uh, certainly among Sunni Muslims, because I think I think my Fatima, my my Smiley friends aren't uh, always <laughs> you know think he's that great, and not all, not every one of my twelve Shia friends thinks he's that great. But amongst the Sunni Muslims, he's pretty good. Right, right? Or Aisha, and, for that matter, right? Or I mean, Aisha, right? Well, we can talk yeah, about that yeah, separately, yeah. right? Because he, I have, he crosses I the Sunni, yeah, Sunni uh, Shia theological lines. Yeah. We we've had some of that. I can talk about that separately. <laughs> you know, on yeah. on Salahuddin, right? And and on Salahuddin, you know, but in the Sunni tradition, he has been very iconized almost to a saintly level, and he was right. this incredibly chivalrous, honorable man. By his enemies' account, I mean, the Crusaders were in awe of his honor and his morality. It right. humbled them and, and it disempowered them. They, it was very hard for them to fight a man who was more noble than them. Right? Mm -hmm. They had been told the Muslims are backwards monsters, and they arrive in Palestine, and then they see a man who is more Christian than them. It humiliated them and took away their impetus to fight. Right? And so he's a bit of one of my great heroes, along with Malcolm X. So I have to write this book. But again, with with his book, you know, I give him a love story. You know, we don't know much about his private life. You know, the, the records, neither the Christian nor Muslim records talk much about his private life. Just yeah. talk about him as a heroic warrior and king, right? And we don't know about his private life, so I give him a love story. And it's Miriam, uh, right? Miriam, I mean, and, it's, and it's a forbidden love story. He ends up falling in love with this Jewish woman that he uses as a spy to infiltrate Richard the Lionheart's camp. the daughter of Maimonides. Uh, well, she was the professional niece of Maimonides, who was the real right. rabbi, who was his close friend, right? That's and true, so, wow. Yeah. Okay. So, I mean, all of that, I mean, the main, the main points of Shadow of the Sword, all the battles and the political events are real. But, you know, I create this fictional love story to guide us through the events, right? Yeah. And, you know, and I thought there would be a lot more of an outcry that I was making Salahuddin have this love affair with this Jewish woman, right? People, you know, I guess Muslims, Muslims are so exhausted with their outcry of mother of the believers, they didn't even bother with this one, right? But, yeah. <laughs> but, you know, the reason I did that, aside from the fact that I needed a good love story, right? And we don't really have historical record of Salahuddin's personal life, very little of it. And so we don't really have that. And so I had to create something to give him a humanity. But that's a people to give him humanity. I love him so much as as an icon like I like like I do Malcolm X. But Malcolm X, you know, you read his autobiography, his humanity is very clear. He you know, we see his early part of his life, which is horrible, and the bad choices he's made, and then how he transforms, right? You know, we don't know anything except really wonderful things about honorable Salahuddin is, and that's not a character you can identify with because he's mm -hmm. not a real human being, because the historians didn't record whatever faults he did have as a human being, right? And so I then created this love story to show him as a complex person who makes mistakes and has passion and emotions and can be misguided at times, which then makes all the historically based heroism that is 100% documented even more beautiful, that he can transcend mm -hmm. those things, right? That's Because I think, again, the history of Islam is human beings who are real people who make mistakes triumph over themselves and become mm. greater and and i had since the historical record doesn't show us that for salahuddin i had to give him humanity to make him real 
Well, I think we'd be remiss if we didn't ask mm-hmm. you, as someone who's written you mm-hmm. know, extensively about the Crusades mm-hmm. and someone yeah. who's in, who is in Hollywood, yeah. what did you think of the depiction of Salahuddin in uh, Scott's movie, Kingdom of, Kingdom of Heaven? Yeah. I mean, it was, it was fine. I mean, if, you look, if you watch the extended version, there's a lot more Salahuddin. Yeah, yeah. yeah you know, again, you know, Fox, the movie studio, put it's, out a... It's, it's a much stronger movie. It's, it's night and day between yeah. those two cuts. I agree. The director's cut is the way to go. <laughs> yeah, and and but again, it was a choice. It was a choice made by the, the, the you know Fox to release that version in which the Muslims and Salahuddin are minimized, right? Mm-hmm. And you know those uh, that may have been an economic decision because it's a very lengthy, it's a three and a half hour movie in the director's cut, and it's a two and a half hour movie, I think, in the actual version that we saw in the theaters. And it's a better movie in the in the longer cut, and that should have been released. So it may have been a decision for there. I wouldn't be surprised if. Uh, some people had within the system had issues with how much Salahuddin time he got and how much honor he got. You know, Bill Monahan is an incredible screenwriter. He wrote The Departed, you know, and he's he's a man I deeply respect because he did honor Salahuddin and the Muslims in his original script. He can't control the end product, which ended up being a decent portrayal of Muslims, right? Um, and but you know, he his intentions were right. And you know, I'm glad that that movie got out. And one day, inshallah, my movie's going to get out. It just might take some time. There you go. So, so do, do you hope to see uh, do you, do you hope to see a film adaptation of this one? Yeah, I mean that was my intention. I mean this is the sh- the novel Shadow of the Swords is directly based on the screenplay. It's a direct adaptation of the original script. Um, I literally just took every scene and made it into a chapter <laughs> and wrote the chapter around the original dialogue from the original screenplay. That's how the book works. And uh, people say, "Wow, this book is incredible! It's like it's like it's like watching a movie. It moves like that." <laughs> I'm like, "Yeah, you have no idea." <laughs> <And> so, <laughs> so that's but that is the intention. I mean, the 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 truth is, you know, my long term ambition for this is to become you know a director because that's where the power is in Hollywood. Uh, it's in two areas. In Hollywood, the two areas that at least are open to me as of today, uh, inshallah, with hopefully some hard work and a little bit of mercy, is, uh, you know, one is television. I'm a writer and I'm, you know, becoming successful, alhamdulillah, in that, in that medium. And so television writers can become the creators of TV shows and become very successful, right? Uh, and they, the writers dominate the television world. Uh, and so I'm already on that path. Uh, I've sold several screenplays that have not yet been made into movies. When one of them gets made, inshallah, and distributed in the, uh, at the movie theater level, then I will be at another level of my career as a movie screenwriter. And from that, I intend to launch my, my career as a director because the two most powerful positions in Hollywood are TV creator, showrunner, and a feature film director. Those are the ones that actually have the power to you know, influence that power structure I'm talking about you know, that is resistant to Islam. Right. You, you know, the, the decision makers, if you're making them a lot of money in TV and you're a powerful you know, movie director, you have the ability to s- s- talk back against the bigots who are making the decisions. And then they have to listen. But until you're at that level, they don't have to listen. That's right. That's you're, my goal. You're given like creative license or, or yeah, I mean, autonomy, I should say, not creative license, but autonomy to. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, show the film that you want to show. Yeah, you have more power. Ultimately, look, unless you're financing it and distributing it yourself, you don't have all the power, right? Unless, right. you know, Mel Gibson um, proved that, you know, he financed Passion of the Christ himself and he got mm-hmm. a distributor and released it and made a billion dollars off. He made, he put $30 million out of his personal, you know, bank account into the movie and made a billion dollars out of it. Uh, mm-hmm. And so he did that himself. But the, the movie he wanted to make, no one in Hollywood was going to distribute it based on their own agendas. And so, you know, I understand why people were upset with the movie. I also think as a work of art, it's an incredible movie, right? Okay. I mean, Passion of the Christ, I think it's a stunning movie, right? And well, uh, and I think it was un- unfairly treated. Well, and, and I, I think, I think it, it's it's worth pointing out that I mean Passion of the Christ essentially marked the end of Mel Gibson's time as a Hollywood yes. star. Yes. And I don't know that there's necessarily a correlation, but it's worth. No, pointing. there's a correlation. There's a correlation. Yeah. Um, you know, I mean, he's. He, I mean, to, uh, to be honest, with, with much well, with much respect to Mr. Gibson, I don't know him personally. I hope one day I do. But with much respect to Mr. Gibson, he's self-destructed. I mean, he has. You're right. I was, that's why I asked. Is, you know, was with, that free meltdown? Respect him. Yeah, with respect to him, he gave his enemies. Uh, the fuel for their fire. In many ways, he was like Richard Nixon. I mean, Richard Nixon right. wrote a piece of very apt, yeah. yeah. I mean, That's Richard very... Nixon could have been the greatest president in American history. He, he gave his enemies what they needed to destroy him, right? You know, if you, if you actually look at what the man accomplished versus the incident of Watergate, he, he, I mean, it's night and day, but his accomplishments will forever be tainted by this one stupid thing. Right, mm-hmm. uh, which mm-hmm. subsequent presidents have done much worse things and have admitted to it and happily admitted to it, breaking the law, right? And much worse things, and we embrace them. 
right? But he he destroyed himself, and, and I think Mr. Gibson did the same. Right. Uh, you know, I, I think I'd, I, I mean I'd love to get your thoughts on I mean continuing with this conversation yes. as well. But but really, you know, like I, I'd mentioned, like three things I really wanted to ask you. The, the other thing I, I'd love for you to comment on is if you looked at the landscape in terms of the literary landscape that's out there in terms of Muslims writing novels, telling their own stories. Okay. I mean, you can't help but mention someone like Mohsen Hamid, right? Mm-hmm. A reluctant fundamentalist. Mm-hmm. Or Ayad Akhtar and his mm-hmm. American Dervish. I think he's written yes. another book as well. There's our own local uh, Wajah Ali, Wajah, yes. who's written a screenplay. Mm-hmm. I mean, has written a uh, uh, a show. Very right? Yeah, with a very successful uh, stage play. I mean, it's right. Just, and uh, like you, a, a a lawyer who's become mm-hmm. a writer. Um, mm-hmm. So uh, I'd love for you to comment on some of you know some of those works and 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 obviously Mosin's book mm-hmm. of Reluctant Fundamentalist was turned into a, mm-hmm. a, a movie as well. Mm-hmm. So. Well, look, I mean, they're all doing wonderful work, and, you know, I have nothing negative to say about them. They've done great stuff, and they're all following their dreams, and they're, they're doing their unique artistic voice. I don't know any of them personally. The okay. great, what's, what's a little bit has happened amongst the Muslims that are making it to some degree is we've all are on our own crazy little island. <laughs> At least I can speak for myself. Well, that's what right? I find fascinating, yeah. right? I, I didn't want any juicy uh, gossip. I mean, I just was really trying to see if there's maybe like a guild or, or some kind of a, you no, know. You know. He wants the password, is it? <laughs> into, no, into I mean, clubhouse. It's, no, I again, I can't speak for what all the other Muslims that are beginning to make it are doing. They may all be part of networks and things. I mean, Wadat Ali has has done a lot of work, and he's he's very prominent. And I got to meet him at Columbia, you know, last year, and so he's a very nice guy, and he's worked very hard for what he has. So, you know, my path has been a little different, you know, partly because I've been this lightning rod and. The initial reactions that Muslims have had to my material have always been negative, and then it becomes positive, right? <laughs> and so because of that, it's forced me to be isolated because I realized the Muslim Ummah won't support me until uh, I don't need their support. And so it's already succeeded. Like, oh, brother, we always believed in you. That's been my journey, right? And so I have to, um, I have to intentionally keep my distance. I love this religion, and I love this community. And unfortunately, the only way I can help it is to be independent of, of it to some degree and just do my own thing. And, and that's what I found. It's, it's a little bit of a tragedy, but it's just based on 12 years of experience that whenever I try to do this Muslim networking thing, um, it doesn't lead to a better work coming out of me or out of them. And so I just think that maybe this is Allah's plan is that we all do our own thing. And, that, and, and there's a blessing that, you know, Muslims are always talking about, brother, we must have unity. Muslims have never been unified, right? The only time they were unified was when the Prophet ﷺ was alive. The day he dies, they start arguing. In fact, they start arguing a few days before he dies, right? You know, when he's sick, if I wrote in Mother of the Believers, based on real accounts, where he was trying to give a final instruction to the Muslims when he was sick, he was coming in out of consciousness, he was trying to tell the Muslims probably what he wanted them to do. And that would have solved the Sunni Shia thing that happened afterwards. Right. But they started arguing. The Sahaba was like, he's sick, you know, he's coming in out of consciousness, he may not know what he's saying, what if he makes a mistake and we misinterpret it? What if it leads to, you know, some kind of fitna? And he got so fed up with him standing arguing that he just said, forget it. You know, he literally just said, stop. I, you know, and he just, he just wouldn't write down what his final instructions were. We'll never know what those were. And I believe that's intentional from Allah. Because I actually believe this. I believe that the strength of Islam is actually not in its unity. It never has been. The that's strength right. of Islam is its, its diversity and its, its ability to spread everywhere independently. You know, the Prophet said that Islam is like water. And if you think about what water is, water, aside from the fact that water gives life, right, water actually just, it dissipates around everything, right? You know, every time you think you destroy water, you burn it, it just takes, it becomes a cloud, comes right back, right? You turn it into ice, it just turns, you can't, water just, you know, is able to go around everything and come back. And that's its power. And so I actually believe that Allah from the very beginning intended for the Muslims to be, you know, disorganized, disunified and at each other's throats at times because it keeps them on their toes and prevents Islam from becoming a centralized monolith that can be destroyed. Now, the Catholic Church is going through all kinds of you know, historical issues in the last century because it is a centralized institution. Right. right. And as a result, you know, it can be attacked centrally. Whereas Muslims, you know, you could take out a whole section of Muslims and half the planet and the rest of Islam continues, right? Because we, we aren't organized. That's our blessing. So in many ways, I think that what I'm doing here by sort of keeping my, my own profile and doing my own thing is protecting Islam because God forbid, you know, my lightning rod eventually just burns up under the lightning and I'm done. It's not going to hurt Wajah Ali or anybody else. They've got their own thing going on, mm. right? You know, my, you know, Malcolm X being taken out doesn't stop Islam. 
you know, it just keeps spreading, right? And that, I think, is actually the blessing. You know, I help my brothers and sisters when I can, but I think it's better for everyone to do their thing. Yeah. Well, to that point, I mean, uh, you, you talk about yourself as a lightning rod, and, and mm-hmm. I, I don't doubt that you've experienced a lot of that, but you're also, uh, you've, you've also been a role model for a lot of people who oh, uh, are, are hoping to, to break in. And so uh, what, what advice do you have for people who, who want to break into to specifically in, into to Hollywood, but in more general terms in, in media, uh, in, in terms of keeping their compass straight as, as far as their, their religion goes? Okay, well, there's two things. I mean, there's practical advice on how to break into Hollywood, which I can give the Muslims, and there's also the spiritual advice. So, so let's talk for a second about the practical advice, okay? Uh, the practical advice is that the first thing is I, I encourage Muslims to constantly be uh, – Trying to break in, as like I said, we need a, we need Muslim filmmakers and storytellers and artists of all kinds, musicians. We need all of them. We need comedians. We need every, we need film editors. We need everything, right? And then ultimately, we need Muslims as executives and, and decision makers and film producers and the heads of Walt Disney. That's what we need, right? Okay. So that's they have to do it. The only way they can do it is if they uh, first they approach it just like what they do with everything else. You know, the great thing about Muslims is that we're actually very disciplined in our personal lives. That's why so many of us are pretty successful doctors and scientists and engineers, is that we figure out the profession, we learn how it works, and then we work very hard and are persistent. And then we master those things. Those are the only traits you need in Hollywood. They, in order to succeed in Hollywood, you there are three possible ways to succeed in Hollywood. Um, and I did, I'm doing it through the, the worst possible way, and that's actually the most important way. The best possible way to succeed in Hollywood is through contacts. If you are Steven Spielberg's nephew, that's a good place to be, right? If you happen to be Peter Jackson's best friend, that's a good place to be because Peter Jackson hired some of his best friends from early days in New Zealand in his earliest small films, and they were the same people he took to Lord of the Rings and continues working with. That's a good place to be. The best way to be successful in Hollywood is to know someone. I didn't know anyone. I have no relationships, and like I said, because of lightning rod, I have a lot of enemies. So that's really that's not even helpful, right? And so unfortunately, I don't have that. The next possible way that uh, that you can succeed is intangible, is talent, right? And talent can only come, you know. I do believe that people are born with a certain ability, but they can hone it. So I don't actually believe in talent that much. I believe that even if you are born with mediocre ability, if you just learn the craft and do the process. It might take five years. It might take 20 of discipline, of learning and failing. Eventually, you will become a master of the craft. So, like you know, 10, that's... Hours. Yeah, the 10,000 hours philosophy that's, mm-hmm. that's been written about in several books. Right? That's right. Well. So, yeah. you can become the master. Um, but, you know, talent is, again, it's... But even Hollywood, that actually doesn't matter. I know people who have mastered uh, screenwriting and other skills here and who are not successful, right? Because... This industry isn't ultimately about talent. We all know there's a lot of bad movies out there. There's a lot of bad TV shows, right? And people are, because again, the first rule is your contacts. So the people that are getting most of the work are getting them out of the relationships, right? And if they're not talented, they'll still get the work. That's right. They're right? still talent, you know, talentless <laughs> yeah. hacks that are still yeah, making movies. Exactly, because their buddies are giving them jobs, and then they're going to protect their buddy when they succeed. So it's a cycle of mediocrity, right? That, you know, and so talent, I've seen a lot of talented people. Yeah, I mean, Michael I went to UCLA Film School. A lot of talented people fail and leave Hollywood. So talent, you do the mastery 10,000 hours for yourself. It does not guarantee that you will succeed in this industry. So that's not, that's not useful, right? Mm-hmm. The only thing that I have is the advice I give Muslims, which is persistence. Mm-hmm. That is the only way. Because, alhamdulillah, I think I do have some talent, and I think I've gotten to a certain level of mastery with my work, right? And that hasn't made it easier. You know, and so as a result, I just keep writing and writing and trying this. 99% of my journey has been failure. It's not pleasant. You know, people don't think that's accurate. It's 100% accurate. I, I'm pitching all the time. I'm writing all the time. And 99% of it, stuff that I think is brilliant, that will win the Emmy, that will win the Oscar, is just rejected by some low-level person who, you know, is not smart enough to understand. It's not smart enough to understand my genius, right? That kind of thing, right? But it's actually true sometimes. It's like, holy crap, I actually gave you something that'll work. Like, and you put this thing on the air, right? And, and, and you go through it. After you go through it for 12 years, you realize that the quality of the work isn't going to matter. You just do the quality of the work out of self-respect, right? Yeah. But, hmm. And so you just keep trying. And so, you know, that's the only thing I do. Whatever success I've had is that I, I fall on my face flat, I try to learn from a mistake, and I get up and I do it again. And so the fact that I'm still surviving it after 12 years with not only, you know, no major network. I mean, 
you would think I'd have a lot of buddies. I actually don't. I mean, my personality is such that I, my, that's the light in my personality. I mean, people, I mean, a lot of shows I've worked on, I probably made a lot of enemies. People just don't like the uppity, loudmouth Muslim guy, right? And that's my fault. That's just who I am, and I'm not going to change. It's just who I am. It's the, it's the, it's the ego and the, the arrogance, if you will, that has allowed me to do whatever I've achieved in life is this personality. But that personality puts people off. Because people especially, uh, yeah, people, people want a quiet worker. They don't want this aggressive go for a guy. But the only reason I've gotten this far is aggressive go for a guy. Nobody wants that. So the only way I can overcome my, my personality, which creates enemies, is to just be persistent. Right. No, I, I, it's remarkable. Uh, you know, like, so our, our show is called, you know, Diffuse Congruence. Mm-hmm. And the idea of Diffuse Congruence is that if you have, you know, these disparate voices, these diffused voices, if you will, all saying the same thing, that it precludes the possibility that what they're attributing or what they're, or, or sorry, what they're attesting to is a conspiracy or is false. And, and remarkably. And it can't be silenced. Like we said, it can't be silenced. Right, right. And no, and remarkably, what, what you said in terms of the three things, the three key ingredients to making it in Hollywood, you know, I was listening to, um, a, a, a podcast very recently that had Jim Lee on, uh, from the comic book world. You know, and, and he's this sort of struggle. You know, he's now what co-editor of DC Comics, co- co-publisher. Sorry, co-publisher. And you know, he, he's this. He grows up. You know, he's, he's I think he's, in, he's born to an immigrant family. Uh, you know, uh, or, or actually, sorry, immigrates here as a very young boy, much like yourself, uh, and grows up here. And he just it's persistence. He just he just continue drawing, continue doing the art, and now look where he is. You know, one of the most sort of celebrated artists of uh, in the comic book world. Right. That's, that's the key. And, you know, if you, the other practical advice, and we'll go to the spiritual advice you asked me for, for most of how to keep your mom, because I think it's important. The practical, you know, if you read, if there's any book to read that'll motivate you to work your butt off and do this is classic self-help book, Think and Grow Rich, right? Napoleon Hill, right? If you mm-hmm. read Think and Grow Rich, and that's written like in 1920, and it's still the best self-help book ever written. And what's amazing mm-hmm. is his chapter, he has a chapter on the quality of persistence as the, the core to success. And in every chapter, he gives historical examples. And what is the example he gives in chapter on persistence? Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Wow. This is a Christian writer in the 1920s wow. writing the best-selling book to this day of self-help, self-motivation. And his book, Chapter on Persistence, is about the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And he says that if there's any persistence is the key to success, and if there's anyone you can learn persistence from, it's this man, because he should not have succeeded from an early point of view. He just kept persisting. And, mm-hmm. you know, and that's what the blessing of Allah, 1920, that book... Allah put it in this gentleman's heart to write that the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is the, the number one example of persistence in human history. And that's the key to success. Think about that. Huh. Wow. That's, a, that's, that's the beauty of this religion. It's, a, you know, it's just remarkable. So, all right. Now, with regard to the spiritual values, because, you know, I, again, because of my lightning rod personality and because so many Muslims assume because I've had whatever success in Hollywood and because I've done the material that I've done that I have, you know, that I'm some kind of, you know, on Islamic or, you know, yeah, Uncle Tom, Tom Stella, Uncle Tom, whatever, or, right? I'm like, buddy, I ain't no Uncle Tom. I mean, exactly. My problem is I'm this Malcolm X type, right? Who just, who just everyone gets angry at, right? Because he's like, oh, the Muslims, and you know, I wish they even knew that. They don't, right? But whatever. So that's, but they perceive me that. I, look, number one, I'm not a particularly good Muslim. You know, I do my best. I don't have to list my, my, how many times I pray or fast. I don't have to list my sins. Those between me and God, right? But I, but I will say this, right? I love this religion from the heart. I love this deen. You know, whatever crappy Muslim that I am on a personal level, I love this deen sincerely. I'm very glad I'm a Muslim. I've studied all the world's religions. I know them very well. I respect all of them. I love Islam. I personally believe Islam is the purest, cleanest, and most straightforward representation of the spiritual truth that is in all of these religions, right? And I would never want to be anything else. I could, tomorrow if I want to be, I could be a Buddhist. I understand Buddhism better than a lot of Buddhists do, right? But Islam works for me with no disrespect to another religion. So that's where I am. And so that startles a lot of people that a guy in Hollywood still has that perspective, right? He's very open about it. Um, and I think that at the end of the day, it's a challenging thing because the world that we work in in Hollywood is full of many things that are un-Islamic. I mean, there are some that argue that all of it is un-Islamic, right? Even movie making is un-Islamic. Okay, I won't take it to that place because I don't believe that. Yeah. Uh, but you know, there's definitely things that you face. And because I have no power, you know, I have limited power to, uh, to influence the final product of things, you know, you have to swallow things. Like on Sleeper Cell, when I joined the show and I saw the pilot and there was a lot of nudity and sex, 
uh, including the Muslim main character, was doing these things, I said to the guys, I said, you know, this is going to get you a backlash. More than all the, the, the horrible stonings to death and torture that's in the pilot episode of Sleeper Cell that Al-Qaeda is doing, you have this Muslim guy who's having sex outside of marriage. It's not halal. And you're gonna, and that was the one thing. We had meetings with different Muslim groups in L.A. who were outraged by that one seed. I told them that's exactly what's going to happen. They, they weren't outraged about all this horrific torture because they're used to seeing Muslims doing that. They're not used to seeing a Muslim in bed with a woman. <laughs> and so... And, and that, and I knew there would be a backlash. And w- that's actually some of the biggest criticism I got from Muslims is how could you be involved in a show that that showed a Muslim committing zina, committing you know unlawful sex? And I said, look, I didn't create the show. The guys wanted this to be a part of the character's journey that he fell in love with this woman. Showtime is an adult network that has that in many ways prides itself on open sexuality, right? Mm-hmm. That's what they're giving their, their subscribers, and they were, they were not interested in a show about a nice Muslim guy who's always wearing white clothing and, oh, stuck for a lot, I cannot look at the woman. They weren't, they weren't going to make that show, right? Yeah. They weren't going to do it. And so I said, this show is going to get on the air whether I'm involved or not, and this stuff is going to be in there. I can't control it. But I can influence whatever positive stuff about the positive representation of Islam that I can, and I did. And, you know, there's... That's that's a choice, right? It's a choice. There were Muslims. I remember there were Muslim extras on, you know, on an episode of Super Cell when I was on the set. There was a, uh, a gentleman who was an extra in the scene. You know, he's playing a Muslim in, in the masjid, and you know, he was of the, he was one of these people that didn't believe that you know that music was halal, for example. And there was a scene where he saw some characters, some Sufi musicians doing music. And he just felt, he got up and he walked out and he came and he lectured me in the, and said, how can you be involved in this, you know, promoting Muslims doing music? I said, well, I, first of all, I don't believe music is haram. I, mean, I don't believe that at all because Muslims have been the greatest musicians in history. We invented the guitar in Islamic Spain, right? So and, this but, guy was, but, but this guy he was... He got up and walked out for that reason, yeah. But he was an extra on a Hollywood set. Yes. So you see the inner contradiction, right? You yeah, contradiction. I mean, I'm just, okay. Yeah, you well, see the contradiction. No, you, but you raise a good person. point. I mean, I, or you raise a really interesting point, and, and you know, I think off air we were talking yeah. about the recent controversy yeah. with with this whole video of uh, somewhere in America and what yeah. and whatnot. But to, I, I'd love for to you know, in, in the few minutes we have left, to talk about you know this idea of Muslim either uh, Muslim cultural production, right, producing their own culture, yeah, and. And I think history bears testimony to this: is that there's always been a tension between this, mm-hmm. the aesthetic expressions of Islam, mm-hmm. and the so-called quote, "quote unquote" orthodoxy. And whether that orthodoxy is represented by, uh, you know, scholars or imams or what have you, or just or, a loud mouth on the street who thinks he knows a thing, yeah. You're right, exa- exactly. But there's always been that 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 conflict. I think Muslim history bears this out between this this, this on the one hand, like I said, is this yeah. And, and by the way, I, there has always been that, and art always wins in Islamic history. Art always wins. Well, see, that's okay. It's possible to stifle art. You went exactly it's where I wanted to go, though, which is yeah. where. Do you feel, though, that, you know, that, that, that I think that there's going that, that you know, if, if Muslims are going to be involved in this enterprise of cultural productions or, or sorry, producing culture, mm-hmm. cultural production, it's going to be messy. It's going to be towing. It's that's going to art is. But, you know, be that's pushing the envelope, if you will. You know, it's very important that, if, you know, if we're running out of time, I just want to conclude with this idea because it's really important, you know, that Muslims understand that our deen has always, the deen itself is art. The great, if you look at the, what I was reading the, the early sources, the early Islamic seer about the Prophet you, you see how fluidly he lived his life, dealing with situations upon situations, right? Very practically, very wisely, looking 20, 30, or centuries ahead, right? And then you would see the Muslims around him, you know, would often just, they were stuck in doing things exactly, I'll just do exactly what the Prophet did at this moment, and they were afraid to even you know, think for themselves, and he would often get frustrated with them, is that he would have to explain every nuance to them, because they were so afraid of nuance. He would have to explain, no, in this context, you have to do this. And you can even see, you can see, you know, they were, he was very patient, and they would try his patience by constantly be like, no, that's an extreme interpretation. No, you don't have to go there. You know, and we, we see it, I mean, I'll give a perfect example, and this flows into the idea of art. You know, uh, one, of the, one of the scenes uh, that, that's in my novels, again, based on the, the actual sira of the Prophet when the, when the Meccans were attacking Medina in the Battle of the Trench, um, the, the Muslims had built this trench, they dug this trench to keep them out so they couldn't get into the city. And the first day that they arrived, the Prophet had, had put archers on the trench to hold them back because anyone who tried to climb through the trench to invade the city, they would shoot at, right? And so as they're standing there, the um, Meccan armies arrived, like they didn't expect the trench. They're trying to strategize, they try to send guys in, the guys get shot, they, 
they, the Muslims are holding the line, suddenly you've got this, uh, you know, you've got this moment where Bilal, you know, Bilal, he does the azan from the masjid. He's not on the battlefield. He's in the, and they hear the azan, and suddenly all the, you know, it's a, it's a Zohar azan, right? You know, the, the army arrived in the morning at, you know, at Fajr, and it's Zohar, and they've been standing there, and suddenly they all, they all put their, uh, their, uh, you know, bows and arrows away, and they start leaving the position to go back to Medina, to the masjid. And the Prophet said, is, where are you going? Get back to the line. It's like, Ya Rasulullah, it's, it's, it's a Zohar time. It's the, the azan. Right, right, right. We haven't done our prayers. And he's like, you're about to be killed. And he's standing there and he finally says, he goes there and he says, I have not prayed either. He did not, he missed a prayer. He actually never missed prayers. He missed that prayer on purpose. He said, I will not pray. He stood there, said, we will stand here to save the people's lives and then we will pray Qadha afterwards, right? And he had to convince these people this simple common sense nuance that any Muslim should have common sense, lives are on the line, don't leave the defensive position unprotected. And he stood there and refused to pray. He said, we're going to stand here together until the threat goes away. And after Maghrib, the invaders went away because they couldn't see in the dark. And they all went back to the masjid and prayed Qadha. The Prophet led the Qadha, right? But he did not pray that afternoon because he needed to keep people alive. That's the, that's the wisdom, the fluidity, the art of the wisdom of the Prophet So Muslims have always had this battle between the wisdom of the Prophet and its fluidity and its knowledge and its instinct versus their rigidity and their inability to use common sense, right? Mm-hmm. And that's the struggle between art. And art always wins because art is a reflection of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's beauty. You know, there's this beautiful hadith Qudsi where, where the Prophet said, you know, you know, Allah is beautiful and loves beauty, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. And if you look at what we have created throughout history from the Dome of the Rock to the Taj Mahal to the music coming out of Spain to, right. you know, the most incredible poetry to the, to the, you know, thousand and one nights, which are these body, you know, these tales well, of sex that are like, very well written. Not the only Muslims song. write poetry, you know, they wrote about love and not even Sufi love. They wrote about erotic yeah. love. They wrote about erotic love without any shame. That's right. Ibn Hazm writes about this. And, and, and to go back to your, you yes. know, like you, what you said earlier, and then you were just talking about the mm-hmm. generation of, during the time of the Prophet known as the Sahaba, mm-hmm. you know, um, you know, we, again, m- Muslims tend to paint that period period in those individuals in that Very generation idealized. as being this sort of Victorian, you know, austere. But, you know, they used the colloquial of their time and what we would today call profanity. You know what I mean? They, I mean, oh, they, absolutely. Swore, they, they, were, they were rough guys. A lot of that's them. That's right. They guys. swore. They used the colloquial of their time. But nonetheless, they used language that we would be that, that we would consider salty. Well, they were just, but they were real people. But because they were real people, exactly. Yeah, they were but, real people, and they were very. I mean, that the if you the one of the things I'll say in my novel, there's no sex scenes in Mother of the Believers. There are sex scenes in Shadow of the Sword. There's no sex scenes in Mother of the Believers, right? And but there's open discussion where Aisha and Dawanha and the other wives are talking about the Prophet's okay. sex life because that's coming out of Hadith. I'm saying what Aisha herself quoting her the Hadith. She said the Prophet liked to do this. He prohibited this. This is what I did with him last night. That's how straightforward it was. Oh, yeah. And then Muslims with this Victorian colonial brainwashing That's have right. been criticizing me for that. I was like, brother, I think you have a problem with the Hadith. I didn't make it. You think I made that up? Let me show you the Hadith. And then they get very uncomfortable because they want to be 18th and century Victorians. Than anyone else, yeah. But that creeps into early Muslim history from the Persians, right? We, yeah. I mean, Muslim, yeah. a lot of that austerity we get, it's not from Arabia. It's not indigenous. Yeah, it's formality. I mean, it's, it's, there, was, there was an aristocratic formal culture, you know, you know, the, That's the, right. The niqab, as we now do it, the niqab was not common in the Prophet's life, uh, lifetime. Only in the Quran, only the wives of the Prophet are required to be fully veiled. And that's a direct commandment from God for them, right? So you are not like, the ayah says, oh, you know, wives of prophets, you are not like other women, right? And so speak to men through a curtain. Mm-hmm. That was not actually common. Veiling, as full face veils, were common in Iran, in pre-Islamic Iran and Christian Byzantium as a means of differentiating wealthy women. Aristocratic women were veiled right. to show they were superior to the masses. So when the right. Muslims took over Iran and Byzantium, the, the Byzantine culture, the Middle East, they adopted what was an unusual thing. Full face veils were unusual in the days of the Prophet in his lifetime, and they adopted it as a norm because that's what they saw everybody else doing. Mm-hmm. Wow. Well, I mean, we could we could literally keep yeah, going. I mean, you, right. got, you got some really interesting stories to tell. I yeah. guess I guess uh, as we sort of wrap things up, yes. I, I was hoping you could uh, give us a peek into the stuff that you've got uh, on the burner. Yeah, yeah, well, well, the, the big, yeah. The biggest thing I'm doing right now, and you know, there's been a lot of blessings, a lot of obstacles about it. Is I actually, alhamdulillah, I sold a major TV pilot that I wrote, a full script I wrote, uh, set in Islamic Spain uh, last year to Universal, right? 
And it hasn't been announced yet. I mean, I guess on this broadcast, be the first time it'll, anyone is hearing about it. But it's uh, it's very good. but uh, you got a scoop there. But you know, it's been go- it's gone through a lot of obstacles in the past year. Alhamdulillah, you know, Universal fell in love with the script. It's set in the last ten years of, of Granada, and it's about the war between the, uh, Ferdinand and Isabella and the last Muslim king uh, of Granada and how that downfall happened. It's, and it's and it's it's one of my proudest things. Again, I wrote it from the heart. And it sold, right? I had tried to write other stuff. It didn't sell, right? This Islamic thing, and it sells, right? But, you know, the last ten, the last year, uh, we've had a lot of uh, things we've had. I won't list their names, but we've had A-list, Oscar-winning directors read the script, say, I want to direct the pilot, which would be enough to sell it to a network like HBO or, or Stars yeah. or Showtime. Yeah. And then, unfortunately, each, we've had two incidences of, of Oscar-level directors read the script and say, I want to attach themselves. And then their team members uh, convince them to get off the project because they don't want to be associated with Islam. And it's really heartbreaking. Uh, the producer we have is incredible. The reason I'm getting it to these level of directors is the producer is incredible, Masha. We have Lawrence Bender, who is one of the greatest producers of Hollywood. You know, he is Quentin Tarantino's partner for not much of his career. And, you know, and he's one of the greatest producers and he's very sympathetic and respectful towards Islam. And uh, so Lawrence Bender has been championing it because of him. We, we've been able to get it to directors of a caliber that I've never been able to approach in my career. Uh, and I, I, and it was one of the most heartbreaking years of my career because we kept getting it to A-list Oscar directors who would read it within 24 hours because Lawrence Bender is a producer, so they took it seriously. And then say, I want to be involved. And then shortly thereafter, their agents or partners would convince them to back away because they're afraid of them being associated with a positive portrayal of Muslims who are the heroes of the, the story, right? And the Catholics and the Crusaders, you know, or it's not the Crusaders, the, Inquis- the Inquisitors are not the heroes. There are Catholic heroes who are trying to stop the Inquisitors and protect the, the good relation with the Muslims. But, you know, but it's basically a, a, a positive view of Islam. So it's there. If we can get a director of, of that caliber to commit to it, it will sell, inshallah, to a major network. But it's been very, it's been heartbreaking to watch how the system has swooped in and kept pushing people off of that caliber, it's been one of the most heartbreaking years of my career because I come to lie, came to the level of this thing happens, suddenly you're at the top level of the game. You're at the level of, um, you know, you're working at the level of Game of Thrones, right? Because then right. You, that's the level you're working at and suddenly you're not the struggling Muslim guy, you know, lightning rod. Now you're the very successful Muslim guy, lightning rod. So it's been a very heartbreaking year and I ask that you and anyone who's watching this podcast pray for the success of this project. Uh, it has two titles. The original title was Andalus. Uh, Universal changed it to Empires. They thought Empires was more, was more general. I like Andalus, but either way, you know, this project <laughs> set in the, uh, this project set in the last days of El Andalus. Please pray for it because there is an organized effort, just like there was around Mother of the Believers, for the system to get rid of it. Alhamdulillah, it's still surviving, but it's been very heartbreaking. Well, I mean, certainly, hopefully, uh, this mm-hmm. this uh, podcast helps spread the word about it, and it mm-hmm. creates a little bit of a groundswell, hopefully. Hopefully. I mean, you know, a lot of people in the power don't have, care about the groundswell, but we just have to be able to touch someone within that level who says, you know what, I really don't care if my agent is afraid of Islam. I want to do this. Yeah. All right. Right, and, and you know, and and that will happen, inshallah, because there's some magic to the script. It's the very fact that people of that caliber have loved it says something. Well, I think I think that's a great place to leave it. I mean, I I, I want to thank you again for coming on and and talking with us. For, this has been uh, 90 minutes that that breezed by pretty quickly, but you definitely gave a lot of insights into your own experiences, and I think people will hopefully benefit from those. People can can find your books on on Amazon. And of course, uh, your various projects. I'm uh, yeah. hopefully they'll be able to keep seeking those out. Uh, on behalf of Parvez Ahmed and myself, Zaki Hassan, I want to thank everybody for listening. Uh, as I say every episode, please seek us out on iTunes. Please seek us out on Stitcher Radio, and please write us a review on there. Uh, everybody, if you get a chance, we'll be back here again next month. This has been Diffuse Congruence, and thank you for listening.